embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Diseases. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. I'm Tommy Soares, Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations at the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. And today on the Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure and honor of welcoming Carly Teed, who is in the Esteban Fernandez Jurisic Lab in Biological Sciences. Uh, Carly Teed's research takes place at the intersection between neuroscience and ecology, known as neuroethology, using electrophysiology and mathematical modeling, Carle is exploring the neural circuits responsible for color vision in birds and now and how those circuits impact color perception. This is such an awesome, awesome area of research. Carle, thank you so much for coming on, telling us all about it, telling us a little bit about your journey into science and scientific research. I'm excited to hear it all. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to, to be here and to kind of share the stuff I'm really passionate about. Well, I am certain you have quite a trajectory and journey to tell us about. So what I'm going to do is my usual self. I'll turn myself off. I'll let you take the spotlight and uh, we can go from there. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Take it away. All right. Hi, well, uh, this is going to be my talk on the products and process of science and what I've learned through my career so far just as a graduate student at Purdue. I first became interested in science as a young person. I was really into reading and reading science fiction, which got me interested in science fact. And so when I ended up going to college at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, I decided to study biological sciences. I was really interested in plants and the outdoors and thought that maybe something forest ranger-y would be up my alley. But when I took my uh, sophomore year neurobiology class, I ended up becoming really passionate about neuroscience, uh, specifically neural circuits. Uh, and more specifically, the neural circuits found in the part of the brain that's inside your eye, uh, that's also known as the retina. Just as one example of a circuit that I saw, um, something like this, there's a photoreceptor. This is the sensor that responds to light, and it sends that information through different pathways um, from the photoreceptor into the neurons, and back to the brain. And as this information travels, it's transformed by the cells that it interacts with. And this circuit seems really cool and simple, but when you pull them all together, all the different circuits we know about in the human eye, it becomes this really tangled mess of a puzzle that caught my attention. And when I began thinking that I might wanna to go to graduate school, this is what I really started to sink my teeth into. And my neurobiology professor encouraged me to explore this more and try to get research experience. So I started off getting research experience in a lab that is a psychology lab. Uh, I worked under doc Dr. Adam Johnson and we built a electromyogram and electroencephalogram for mice and rats. Uh, we wanted to see how their hippocampus was activated during a maze. But honestly, the progress was slow and we never got to actually doing the experiment while I was there. I just worked with the engineers. And the big thing that I felt like I took away from my time at the lab was being exposed to this book called Vehicles, Experiments in Synthetic Psychology. This book shows a couple of examples of how wires and motors and just changing those changes uh, behavior of these little robots. For example, this robot here has, these are little light sensors that are connected to the wheels. 
If you have the light sensor connected to the wheel uh, directly on the same side, the little robot will always drive away from the light. But if you make just one small change and swap the um, connections of those wires so that the sensor is connected to the opposite wheel, the little robot will always chase the light. And this really fell, flew into my ideas of how circuits are built and how we can take just small little pieces of information compounding on each other to give us this really cool experience of the world. Also during this time, I started reading the literature. I ended up really liking color vision circuits because they're flashy, it's really a cool topic. And I started learning about color vision in jumping spiders, in mantis shrimp, in octopus, in mice, and they all use completely different mechanisms and completely different circuits. And I just thought that was so cool. Uh, so for my th senior thesis, I did a literature review called Current Ecocentric Models of Color Perception. And in this literature review, I talked about all of these different models for these different species, how they interact with each other, and how maybe people should start thinking about this. And that's when I fell in love with the products of science, these research papers. I could never get enough of just reading um, the color vision literature that was out there. And so when I applied to go to graduate school, I ended up um, really wanting to work with Esteban Fernandez Hurisic at Purdue University. Esteban studies um, bird vision broadly, and even uh, vision in some other species. He looks at color vision, he looks at um, visual perception of space, and uh, how far behind a duck can it see? And how does this affect how it behaves? If a duck can see behind its head, can it see a predator when its face is down at the ground? And so I was really interested in this translation of the neuroscience into the application and behavior. And so I really wanted to work with him, and that's why I came here. Um, I also work with Dr. Alex Chubikin. He's my co-advisor, and he has the neuroscience equipment that allows me to actually look at these circuits. And so here, my research is how does color information travel from the bird's eye uh, in the sensors all the way to the brain? And this is kind of the dream come true uh, project because right now we don't really know anything about how that information happens. The kind of circuit that this information travels along is known as an opponent channel. And opponent channels can be arranged in a variety of ways, but we're gonna kind of just simplify and look at one of them. Uh, this one circuit, all of the circuits have bright light, color-dependent photoreceptors called cones that capture the light and con convert it into an electrical signal. Then there's, at some point in the circuit, a cell which compares the responses of these cones. And then lastly, there's cells that compare, carry these comparisons to the brain where we get further processing. And this is the mechanism by which one or more cone signals are antagonistically compared. So here uh, we have two cones, and these cones have different spectral sensitivities. So the cone on the left here is primarily excited by reddish orange colors. And the cone on the right here is primarily excited by the blue side of the spectrum and doesn't really respond to the reds. And this circuit now has excitatory input from one cone class and inhibitory input from another cone class. And if we were to stick an electrode into these cells and look at the responses of the comparator and the cells beyond, they'll have this thing called spectral opponency, where the cell can be excited by a portion of the visible spectrum and inhibited by another portion of the visible spectrum. So this cell, horizontal cell here, is excited by the oranges that it gets from this cone and inhibited by the blues that it gets input from this cone. And it'll send that information all the way back to the brain. And this is the kind of circuit that I was looking for and hoping to find in birds. And in order to predict what I would expect to find in birds, we looked for cone opponency and spectral opponency in other species. And I wanted to know, like, how should I design my experiment? What sample size should I expect to need? Uh, what size pipettes or what fluids should I use to keep the cells happy and get all the recordings I need? And so I did what I knew how. I turned to Google, typed in cone opponency, 
uh, and started reading and started trying to collect some information that would help me figure this out. And it turns out there's a lot of animals that have this circuit. There are turtles, there are wallabies, sturgeons, guinea pigs, zebrafish, leopard frogs, and goldfish, and so many more. And this is just the stuff that I found in the first like two months where I was kind of familiarizing myself with the subject. And the literature is pretty extensive. It goes all the way back to 1953 is when these first were discovered. And each paper um, usually looks at like between one and five species at a time. Secondary literature or reviews of published papers tend to look at maybe just a group of animals such as fish or one type of cells in this circuit, maybe ganglion cells. There's not really a spot where you can find everything that we know about cone opponent circuitry just in one place. It's really far out there and hard to get to. And this got me thinking, I was really interested in these products of science, in these pieces of primary research, and I wanted them to be accessible to more people. And so I ended up, um, my PI and I decided that I should work on a literature review, a place where we could collect all this information and then see the implications that these cells have for behavior. So I rebegan the literature search process. In the first go through, I was just searching on Google, but to make this a really important piece of um, unbiased product that I'm trying to produce, it needs to be reproducible and consistent. So I did a different literature search. Next, I analyzed the data that I collected from the literature, and I'll be sharing some of those results with you today. And I'm working right now on the process of synthesizing the literature and putting together my own piece that reflects all of the stuff I found, as well as a database so that other people can come along and find what they're looking for in the literature more easily. So as I mentioned, the first time I kind of just Googled, um, I didn't know what I was doing, but now I've worked on a reproducible literature search. When you just search the literature by yourself, uh, you may have biases in your search. Maybe I would favor horizontal cells over amacrine cells in my method of searching, or maybe I would have just a bias to look at goldfish because I think their visual system is pretty cool. Uh, but a reproducible literature search is a method of reviewing the literature, which is transparent and reduces viewer bias. So I use these things called search queries. Uh, and here's an example of one of the search queries I used in one of the databases. And this is something that you could take, you could copy and paste, and you'd find all the exact same papers that I found. And then we use search criteria to search through these papers to filter out which ones are relevant. And so here's kind of the process where I used these queries and found 1,722 papers uh, that could be relevant to cone opponency. But after uh, going through a long process of eliminating things based off of um, criteria that I had, I narrowed it down to 96 results, 96 papers on cone opponency. Uh, but unfortunately, at the end of this 96, I realized that there are some missing from my original just two month long Google search. There were key pieces of literature that didn't come up in my search. Also at the same time I'm doing this, I'm also working on my research and I've been hitting some roadblocks at this time. Uh, my equipment's not working, things aren't just going the way that I wanted it to. And so I found it maybe easier and more comfortable to dive into the literature where there's already these pub published products that people have already worked so hard on and um, I can find certainty in these things that are already published. So back to the, the reproducible literature search, to fill those gaps, I ended up doing round two. In round two, I took those 96 results and did a process called citation chasing, where I looked at everything those papers cited and everything that cited those papers to try to fill in the gaps that I knew were there. And after going through the same process of eliminating irrelevant papers, I ended up with 47 new results. And so those 96 and 47 papers resulted in having 143 papers about cone opponency in a variety of species. 
So I started doing some analyses and first just some basic description, descriptive analyses. We ended up finding information on cone opponency in 67 different species. And these aren't just evidence of cone opponency. These are species for which the specific circuits from cone to comparator to brain are known. Um, unfortunately, there was only one in the bird, so that didn't really give me much help uh, with designing my studies. Um, I couldn't really predict what sample size I would need based off of only one reported study, whereas uh, we can now predict maybe how many samples you'd need to take in fish to find everything you'd need to look for. Uh, and we also found information from seven different cell types in four different brain regions. But right now we're just going to focus in on that one uh, first comparator I mentioned before, the horizontal cell. We found data on the horizontal cell from 27 different species. And I wanted to see, again, that like circuit map, how these circuits are built and compared in these 27 species. So here's kind of a basic map inspired by the goldfish. Um, it starts off with an input from the long wavelength sensitive photoreceptor, which sends input to this horizontal cell here. This one responds in the same direction, regardless of the wavelength of light. And so we call it a luminosity cell. And it's thought to be the first step in determining brightness um, in, in fish vision, at least. This long wavelength uh, sensitive cell sends its information to the L-type cell. And this model is called feed forward inhibition uh, because this L-type cell sends that information forward into the mid-wavelength sensitive photoreceptor. Mid-wavelength sensitive photoreceptor then sends that information and its own light response onto the first comparator cell. This is the C-type horizontal cell or chromaticity uh, because it has a color specific response. And we can continue the circuit where we then take the biphasic, because it's got two phases, uh, horizontal cells spectral response, feed it into a short wavelength sensitive cone or a blue sensitive cone. And then that one will uh, feed onto another horizontal cell and produce a triphasic response where it's got three phases. Um, and this could just keep going and going. And these circuit maps were what I was hoping to be able to find, and I found lots of them. And I was kind of curious, are these built the same way for, for, for all of the species, or are they built differently amongst different species? So what I'm going to show you is kind of a tree of how these responses are built uh, based off of the last figure. Starting off, we have just a luminosity type horizontal cell that responds um, uh, this direction exactly like this, regardless of the wavelength of the light. It could be a peak down here in the orange or a peak over here in the yellow. Either way, it's going to respond um, just one direction. Uh, this cell then feeds onto uh, the biphasic cells that I showed you. And biphasic cells could be of two types. We could have biphasic cells that are inhibited first in the shorter wavelengths and excited in the longer wavelengths. Or we could have uh, biphasic cells that are excited by blues in the shorter wavelengths and inhibited by reds in longer wavelengths. And when we look at the actual distribution of these, we find that out of the species that we've reported, um, three of them have the biphasic arranged in this way, and 24 of them have a biphasic arranged this way. And if we continue to feed forward that information following that circuit, uh, we can end up with a triphasic cell that either has an excitatory, inhibitory, excitatory response, or an inhibitory, excitatory, inhibitory response. Uh, these can be the two different ways triphasic cells are arranged, so let's add those all in now. Um, and you can see that over here we had quite a few, and everything kind of tapers out on this end. We have fewer over here. And if we go this even further, not every species has biphasic, triphasic, and very few species have tetraphasic horizontal cells. These tetraphasic horizontal cells uh, can be plus, minus, plus, minus, or they could be minus, plus, minus, plus. Um, and if we decide to add all of those in now, we get a tree that looks like this. It represents the way that the information can flow just through the horizontal cell layer of the retina. And now let's prune this tree down from all the possible possibilities to the actual possibilities that are represented. 
Uh, so starting off, and the, the thickness of the line re, uh, represents how many species follow this pathway. So starting off with our luminosity type cell, we have the branch over here to the left where we go positive, negative, and then negative, positive, negative. Um, there's only three species that go over here. And something I'm working on right now is trying to do a phylogenetic analysis to see if these three species are different in some way than all the species that are off on this side. Um, we have two turtles and one fish over here. On this side, uh, we have 24 species that have positive, negative, 11 species, negative, positive, negative, and then fewer species on the other branches. And as you can see, having tetraphasic cells is really uncommon. Triphasic cells is less common than biphasic. Um, and then every species that we know of has the monophasic or the L-type cell. And the process of figuring this out um, has been something that I've been really interested in, how the results that I have, these circuit maps, seem just so clear to me, but the process of them being discovered and developed was actually very confusing uh, throughout history. In fact, the initial discovery that caused all this confusion um, was the discovery of this spectral response. Um, so let me walk through that real quick. In 1953, the spectral response was discovered by Svetichin. Svetichin uh, discovered the first graded potentials and dubbed them cone action potentials. It was thought to this point that um, neurons only fired action potentials. They didn't know that neurons could do um, minute changes and send signals in that way. Um, and so, so at the time um, when Svetichin uh, discovered this, he ascribed this response to the photoreceptor and said, this is what photoreceptors do. Um, as you and I know now, this response is not from the photoreceptors, but is from second order neurons, the comparator cells. And in 1957, Tomita made the argument that this can't be from the photoreceptors because the cones that Svetikin said that he recorded from are only five micrometers big or eight micrometers big. And the pipette he used was five micrometers across. And it would be impossible to essentially attach this cell to this pipette tip. So he must have recorded from something else, something that was bigger. And in 1960, they were trying to figure out then, okay, it's not cones. And also these cells now, they discovered not only the excitatory portion of the response, the L-type cell, but also the inhibitory portion. And they thought at the time that neurons couldn't send signals via inhibition. Um, so maybe it doesn't fire action potentials, it doesn't send signals via inhibition, so maybe this response isn't coming from a neuron at all. And Svetikin proposed that this response was coming from a glia cell. And glia cells are support cells inside the retina that provide structure for the neurons. The neurons are kind of embedded in them. And they also manage the ion currents outside the neurons. So he thought maybe the thing I've been recording from are glia cells. Uh, but by 1970, it was conclusively confirmed by Conoco that the cell that these responses came from were horizontal cells. These cells, um, the way he did this was he put the electrode inside the cell and then was able to stain it using the same electrode he recorded from. So he could take a picture of the exact cell that produced the response. And it was this horizontal cell. But that still doesn't get us all the way to the diagrams. But by the late 1970, these diagrams became uh, very available in early 1980s. And this process of getting from discovering the response profile to knowing exactly what that means uh, was actually kind of long and complicated and didn't just happen in one even flow like it may look like when you just read through the literature. Uh, and here's here's some pictures of Svetikin uh, and Tomita that I mentioned before. Um, I think it's really cool just looking through the literature, being able to find these real people. 
And now we're getting back to my experiments. Uh, I'm wrapping up the last bit of my data collection on the experiment that I designed based on these principles. Like in reading these reviews, I learned that I needed to change the size of my pipette tip to get at the cells I wanted to get to. Uh, but I also learned that I've been working on this project for four years now and it's still not done. And when I came into science, I had this idea that I would produce something beautiful like these other papers that I've seen. But doing something from scratch actually is really hard. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of uh, figuring things out. And reading through this process of the literature, seeing how the literature evolved from having no idea what these um, spectral responses were to now knowing exactly how they're composed uh, gives me a lot of encouragement that I'll soon be able to have something to contribute, even if it's not the, the full complete picture that I had dreamed I'd be able to produce. And so, yeah, now I've spent a lot of time in the literature and I've fallen in love with this color vision literature, this cone opponent literature. And I'm really looking forward to one day being able to install my own piece in here, bring my own work, uh, my thesis into this, into this community of work. And now I pass this on to you. Uh, I want you to think about the things that you're passionate about, uh, the progress that you're going to make, the literature that you find just so interesting, you could read it all day and uh, use that to drive you forward. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome work. Thank you so much. And uh, I wonder if we can, go back to uh, uh, the side-by-side -side view. Um, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. It's such great work, Carly. I, and you know what is incredible is also your uh, eye for design and how to put these slides together in a way that most of us who are haven't seen this type of work before can really digest it. It's so incredible. Tell us a little bit, you know, like what did you what what do you have to study in order to be ready to do this type of work? Oh yeah. So um when I first kind of expressed interest in neuroscience, um, my advisor at my small liberal arts school was like, uh, get a textbook, find a textbook on the thing you're interested in and just work on that. Um, he gave me the opportunity to teach him and gave me weekly meetings where I could give him a lecture on the thing I was passionate about to try to find my niche within that. Um, and so I think that's always a great start. Um, I think it was great for me and it helped me come into graduate school with a good background of the things that I wanted to know. But the things that I didn't come in with a background in, right, is the hand skills to do the actual neuroscience. Um, I do whole cell patch clamp, which is a very difficult um, technique. And so that's something that you need just training to do. Um, there's no, you can't read papers and figure it out. You just got to got to keep poking cells with electrodes. It's totally, it's so difficult. It's so hard. Um, and it's so easy to screw it all up all the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, and it takes a lot of patience, but it seems like, you know, as you've been getting into the literature and being inspired by this literature, there is also this sense of, you know, you're doing the work and contributing to maybe what is a large volume of work, but you're you're making your own contribution to it, even if it's not, as you said, the big picture that mm -hmm. you had at first. What keeps you motivated? What keeps you going, even if not all the experiments come up right, or even if oh, you, yeah. po you over poke those cells and uh, <laughs> what's the size of the pipettes and all of this, all of the stuff that you need to do and do in, in the work that you do. Yeah, at first, when I like first started graduate school as a first year, I was it was easy to stay motivated on just like passion for science, right? Um, like this is the thing I wanted to do, and I'm so privileged to be able to do the thing I wanted to do. Um, but after like three years, that kind of tapers off <laughs> for sure. And so I think for me, honestly, part of it is having work-life balance, um, having things that I'm passionate about doing outside of work that fuel me up 
so that when I go into the lab, I come in uh, full of energy, ready to uh, gamble on my electrophysiology, find the right cell, uh, hope it doesn't explode, hope I get what I need. Um, coming in fueled up from other things really is important to me to get me uh, working through it. Yeah, that's great. That's that's such a great piece of advice too for everybody listening because you do have to keep that balance. In order to work hard, you got to play hard too, and you have to be able to kind of uh, do do them all <laughs> and and <laughs> yes. do, do them every day if you can <laughs> and lead a healthy life in that in that way. Um, I I want I want you to be able to maybe tell us a little bit about these mentors that you've had. You've mentioned b both mentors that, that have been making a big impact in your in your world now, in your research now. Tell us a little bit about their style. Tell us a little bit about your interaction. And I do want to say that, you know, e even though you might have not realized this charge of you teaching your previous professor your previous teacher how what this particular subject and what was the subject if you can share with us oh yeah i i used um john dowling's book uh the retina approachable part of the brain so you were already interested in this from such a young age it's incredible but so you know you teaching him gave you the responsibility of, hey, man, I really have to know my stuff here. Otherwise, mm -hmm. right? Tell us oh, a little yeah. bit about that experience, his mentorship. And then as you moved on to Esteban and Alex uh, as well. Yeah, no, I've definitely had a variety of mentors with different styles. And I think just my quick plug, I think rotations are super important for graduate students because you have to find somebody you click with. And I got very, very fortunate that in undergrad, I had three different neuroscience mentors who really poured into me and saw my passion for the subject, um, starting with uh, William McVaugh, Dr. Dr. McVaugh. Um, he was the one who taught my neurobio class and he was just such a great teacher, very tough, but fair and made you rise to the challenge. Um, and uh, yeah, when I would ask just lots and lots of questions during class, he always tried to be engaged with them. And then when class was over, uh, he definitely was like, hey, you seem to have an interest in this. And I approached him and was like, how, how do I learn more about this? And that's when he was like, hey, you could get class credit for an independent study course where you give me a lecture once a week. Um, and yeah, that was really great. He was such a, he is such a kind and compassionate instructor who was always there to listen, always there to give advice. And teaching is the real reason I came to graduate school. I want to be able to be that for somebody else. And so he helped inspire me to be the kind of teacher that I want to be. Um, and gave me advice not only on the neuroscience material, which to be honest, he wasn't super familiar with. The retina wasn't his background. He was more in immunology and development of the nervous system. Um, but he dedicated some time to me and uh, really helped me put together that literature review. He was my supervisor for that. And so I really can't thank him enough. I still call him regularly and we chat on the phone because um, <laughs> he's he's my like academic father, I consider. Um, Great. And yeah, he's great. Awesome. Um, and so yeah, and then, mm -hmm. in transitioning now to you, to Esteban and Alex's yeah. styles. What, what oh, are... they both have very different styles of mentoring. And I do very different things with them. Uh, with Esteban, he's very hands-on, uh, very like engaged conversation. We fly ideas back and forth. Um, and he wants to know all the minutiae, everything that's happening. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, that's something that I do really well with. I have a strong voice myself. So having a PI who has a strong voice helps the conversation um, kind of stay high. Dr. Chubikin is a little bit more, um, tell me what I need to know, condense it down for me. What is it that's important? And helping me think through what really matters. And let's talk about the experiment. What are we doing? What do your results look like? He's very data-driven versus Esteban's experimental design drive. 
And so having both of them as co-PIs uh, sometimes has, has conflicts like you always do, but is a really, really great balance, I think. Awesome. Awesome. Um, any parting words for us, Carly? Thank you again so much for letting us peer into your life a little bit and uh, uh, giving us a little glimpse into the work that you're doing and your inspiration behind it. Uh, it sounds like it's so exciting. And I thank you for also breaking it down into digestible pieces for us uh, to be able to uh, understand uh, and understand the impact of your work. So thank you. Uh, but are there any parting words that you want to give to us? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having he me here. I just, I really hope that everybody can find just some piece of literature that they're passionate, you know, everybody can find a mentor that can really give them the support they need to get to where they want to go in life and can stay connected with those people. Because I think a lot of what helps me keep going, right, is those personal connections. So maintaining those is really important. Well, fantastic. Thank you again for such, uh, such awesome wisdom and uh, great tips for all of us to listen to. I hope you have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.